Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into part 6 of the Hannibal series. Um, I may skip around on the series after this. It's got a couple of episodes leading up to uh, the Battle of Cannae, which I am super anxious to get into, and I'm going to do a couple of ep episode like breakdown of the Battle of Cannae. So... Um, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do that lead up yet, but I'll, I'll figure it out and the videos will be out relatively soon. Um, also, I finished the Winter War series yesterday. Uh, if you haven't seen that series, it's up in its entirety right now. And part three or four, wherever I'm at in the Eastery series, will be out tomorrow. So, um, with all that being said, let's get into it. The Battle of Lake Trasimene. The defeat of Trabia struck fear into the Roman leadership. The Republic lost all control over Cisalpine Gaul. Hannibal succeeded in bringing Gauls to his side. Near okay, so this is a a precarious situation, this, this Gallic situation. It's precarious for both Rome and Hannibal, right? Because Hannibal gets them on his side because they hate Rome, right? But he doesn't really have their allegiance, and he certainly doesn't have it long term. So he's trying to move quickly while he has the Gaul support, um, and the, the Romans are kind, kind of true, trying to make him attack into an unfavorable position or keep him up as far north as they can, right? They're trying to kind of bottle him up in the north. He has a way to get around it, but it's what the Romans are trying to do. Nearly doubling his army. 40,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry are now under his command. But before Hannibal resumes his attack on Rome, faced with the Gallic uprising in Cisalpine Gaul and still shocked by the loss of tens of thousands of troops at Trebia, the Roman Senate is determined to turn things around in 217 BC. Amidst the political turmoil, two new consuls are elected and sent north against Hannibal with newly raised armies. Other theatres of war are not ignored, evident by the victory against the Carthaginians at the Ebro and the planned reinforcements set for Iberia later in the year. But the main focus of the Roman war effort is on home soil. The plan is to use the geography of the Italian peninsula to their advantage. With the vast marshlands of the Arno River in the west, thought to be impassable during winter and spring, and the rugged Apennine mountain range cutting across the peninsula, the Romans know that there are only two routes into central Italy that Hannibal can take, and they move to block both. Consul Gaius Flaminius positions his army at Aretium, including the 10,000 legionaries that survived the Battle of Trebia. His co-consul, Gnaeus Servilius Geminus, is stationed at Ariminium. Both armies are bolstered with a higher number of horsemen than usual, perhaps to offset their numerical inferiority in cavalry. Yeah, so again, they both go to positions that they, they think Hannibal is going to have to go through to get to southern Italy. So they're in strategically good defensive positions. They're, again, they're trying to bottle him up in the north, right? If he comes south, he's going to have to attack a solid defensive position that the Romans are in. We're about to see how he's going to find a way around it. Hannibal, meanwhile, has problems of his own. While he did establish a base of operations in the Po Valley, Gallic support will weaken over time as his army continues to consume their resources. At the same time, the Romans decided not to pursue further battles in the north, so staying there makes little sense for Hannibal. He needs to put pressure on the Romans before his Gallic allies lose interest in the war. Just like the Senate, Hannibal knows that he can either go down the Adriatic coast and fight Servilius in the rugged terrain of Picinum, or he can fight Flaminius in the difficult Apennine mountain passes. 
neither route is good. Whichever he chose, not only would the Romans be alerted about his movement ahead of time, but he would be forced into a prolonged and uncertain battle against the well-defended Roman positions, which would allow time for the two consular armies to link up, something that Hannibal can ill afford. But with the arrival of warm spring weather, the Carthaginian general does the unexpected. He decides to force march his army across the Apennine Mountains and through the dangerous marshlands of the Arno River, aiming yeah, so this is going to completely surprise the Romans. He's actually going to get down there and across it before they realize that he's down there, right? Now, he's going to lose an eye over it, but it's it works perfectly for surprising the Romans who think he has to take one of the two options that they have both blocked off to surprise the two consuls and get into a good position to threaten Rome itself. The plan is arguably just as audacious as was the crossing of the Alps. The march is extremely difficult. Hannibal places his most disciplined infantry, the hard-marching Libyans and Iberians, at the head of the column. They set a fast pace, which the Gauls find difficult to maintain, as they are not used to forced marches. And by being at the back of the column, they face the added difficulty of having to march through the sticky quagmire that has been churned up by the troops in front of them. The cavalry is in the rear of the column, ushering the Gauls forward and keeping an eye on any who might decide to turn back. Okay, I cannot explain how awful this marsh crossing is. It is brutal. There's, it takes multiple days. There's nowhere to sleep except there's reports of them sleeping on dead animals when, when an animal dies. Um, but then that's just one person. Like it's this whole crossing is so, so brutal. Um, Hannibal's on an elephant and he even gets an eye infection and, and loses an eye, you know, so, or loses sight and eye. So, um, the reports are kind of conflicting on whether he actually gouged out the infected eye or not. But, can you imagine going through something like this? You have multiple days. I think of like, uh, I've watched the, the Navy SEAL Buds videos, right? Where they have to stay up, um, they get very little sleep over Hell Week. And that's what this is, but in just a regular forged, forced march to get ready for a battle or to get in position for a battle. It's just, it's so brutal. The terrain, however, is the army's biggest enemy. The Arno River flooded after winter rains, turning the river basin into heavily flooded, muddy wetlands. The endless, dense swampland offers almost no dry areas for resting. Hannibal's troops wade through deep pools of water for four days and three nights with almost no sleep and no rest, whilst carrying their heavy equipment and supplies. Those fortunate enough to be mounted are able to sleep in their saddles, while a handful of those on foot manage to climb onto the bodies of dead horses and pack animals for a brief rest. Brutal. Many die due to infection, disease, exhaustion and drowning. Hannibal himself catches an eye infection, which cannot be treated because there is no time during the forced march, and he carries the infection for much of the journey, eventually losing sight in one eye. He emerges from the swamp on the back. Yeah, so they said losing sight in one eye. It's, there's, like I said, there's conflicting stories on, on whether he actually gouged out that infected eye or not of his sole surviving elephant, probably the brave Syrian. All the while, the Romans assumed that Hannibal is contained in the north. But what they didn't know is that the Carthaginian general managed to cross the Apennine Mountains and the Arno River wetlands with 50,000 troops in just four days, without being detected, and is now in position for the next stage of his campaign. He grants his army a few days to rest and sends scouting parties south. He learns that Flaminius is at Aretium, 
and that the Etrurian plane can offer enough food and plunder to boost the morale of the troops. Having learned that Flaminius is an arrogant and rash commander, he plans to provoke him into giving battle by pillaging and burning the rich Etrurian countryside. Soon enough, plumes of smoke from burning villages and fields dot the lands west of Aretium, followed by the Carthaginian column passing right next to Flaminius, brazenly taunting the Roman general. Watching from Aretium, Flaminius is fuming, knowing that it is he who is supposed to protect these lands, and yet one of the richest areas in Italy is burning on his watch. But he somehow resists challenging the Carthaginian general, persuaded by his advisers to stay put and wait until Servilius joins him. Unable to force an open battle, for Hannibal, an assault on Aretium is out of the question. He cannot risk losing too many of his experienced soldiers that he cannot replace. His army also has limited supplies and has to keep moving. Yes. So that is entirely correct. Uh, an open attack on on uh, the console here is totally out of the question. They don't have the resources for it, right? But look at the map right now. Hannibal is between the consoles and Rome, which is not what the consoles want, right? So just being in this position... He has a major, major threat kind of to hold over their heads. So continuing to go south is, is dangerous. If the consuls let him leave, for all they know, he could go march right on Rome. Furthermore, Hannibal has no way of knowing how far the other Roman army is. And as far as he knows, Civilius could be arriving any day now. So the Carthaginian general decides to press on. Leaving not one, but two armies in his rear must have seemed mad. But actually, by bypassing Aretium, Hannibal maintains the initiative and keeps the Romans guessing. He wants to be the one who dictates the course of the campaign. Scouts soon bring good news. Flaminius decided not to wait for Servilius after all. Knowing that the battle is soon coming, Hannibal makes sure to let his Gallic troops know that they will be fighting against Flaminius, the man who caused them much misery in years past. Yeah, but think about this from, from Flaminius's perspective. Like, like I said, he just let Hannibal cross with a ton of troops head further south. For all he knows, they're going to Rome. So what is he supposed to do? Is he supposed to just send a messenger to Rome and say, hey, Hannibal's on the way while the two consular armies are out in the field? Or is he supposed to go like try to track down Hannibal? You can see how he's kind of up between a rock and a hard place here. Flaminius is renowned for his victories against Gallic tribes. He is responsible for introducing a law that allowed Romans to settle near and on Gallic lands. This created conflict, which Flaminius resolved by invading and occupying more Gallic lands, and then proceeded to settle more Romans on the lands he conquered. Yeah, the Gauls are going to get their revenge for that. Needless to say, he is hated by the Gauls, and the 17,000 of them in Hannibal's army can't wait to get their hands on him. Meanwhile, for the Roman army that prides itself on its military prowess, it must be humiliating to pass through villages and countryside laid waste by the enemy. But Flaminius can still redeem himself, and he is only one day's march away. It's early morning, on June 24th, 217 BC. Flaminius marches out of his camp towards the smoke rising in the distance, apparently from Carthaginian campfires, eager to get to grips with the enemy. In the front, he places veteran legionaries that survived the Battle of Trebia, who are also very keen on meeting the enemy in battle. As the column moves, a low hanging mist envelops the lake and the valley. Okay, so they see 
from the the entrance to this kind of small little path here along the lake, they see campfires in the distance. They have been trying to track down this massive army that Hannibal passed them with. So, when they see the campfires, they're like, oh, boom, we found them, we got them, let's go get them. And so they start going through this pass towards the campfires, specifically thinking like, oh man, we've got them here, right? Like, this this is our chance. So they are, are rushing through here trying to get to open battle, essentially. Shoreline is eerily quiet. The locals seem to have vanished. Unable to see too far ahead, the Romans literally stumble into Hannibal's heavy infantry, who are blocking the road. Fighting spontaneously erupts at the far end of the valley. Despite being surprised by the enemy, the Roman vanguard forms up in battle formation. Further back, it is some time before the Roman center and rear realize what is happening in the front. The visibility is hampered by the low-hanging morning mist. Okay, so for those of you who may not know what happens here, look at the layout. They have this small pass here. The front of the entrance is black, blocked off. And now with the tail of the, the Roman guard here coming into this pass, they are now officially all in this small confined area. With the front blocked, all you have to do is block the back and there's nowhere for them to go. But in the hills above the mist, Hannibal's hidden troops can clearly see the Roman column. Although they do not know it yet, the Romans walked straight into an ambush. But let's take a moment to consider how difficult it was to set up the ambush at Lake Trasimene. Hannibal couldn't just send his troops up the hill to their positions, that would have left tracks all across the hillside. And with Flaminius hot on his heels, he didn't have much time either. Yet, Hannibal marched to the eastern end of the valley and somehow managed to coordinate tens of thousands of troops around the hills to the north into their correct positions at night. Yeah, I've talked about this before, but when we look at stuff like this from ancient history where they are calculating and coordinating thousands and thousands of men and troops to move and organize and do all of these things, it almost doesn't make sense how they're able to do it, right? Because in the modern day, you're like, yeah, logistics, computers, data, like that makes total sense to me. But how would you go about doing it without any of that? And, and they have some really interesting ways to do it. They use flags a lot. Um, but again, this is at night. So then how, how do you do it here? It's just, it's so um, interesting the way that they are able to make these things work before, you know, the, the technology catches up to, to help them and stuff like this. Um, it's one of the reasons why the, uh, the crossing of the sea, the invasion of the Achaemenid Persian Empire into Greece is so incredible to me is because it is a logistical nightmare in the modern day and and then when you look and, and say okay now no computers and you have you know 60 100 150,000 men depending on the situation um, how do you make it work and somehow they they make it work all within a brief window of time and without arousing any suspicion this is without doubt quite an astonishing military feat. Now, Hannibal signals his hidden forces to attack. It's unclear if trumpets signaled the start of the attack or if his captains were ordered to wait until the Romans were deep enough into the valley. Whatever the case, the ambush succeeds completely. The use of campfires in the distance tricked the Romans into moving deep into the valley, thinking that the Carthaginians are further ahead and by masterfully hiding tens of thousands of his troops in the hills, Hannibal completely surrounded the enemy. 
Coming seemingly out of nowhere, Numidian cavalry and Gallic heavy infantry engage the Roman rear, closing off their line of retreat. Hannibal's light infantry, skirmishers and Gallic heavy infantry clash with the Roman centre. Having previously marched in a very loose formation, Flaminius's army is caught completely by surprise. They soon find themselves in a fight for their life. The formations break up and many soldiers are left to fend for themselves. The fighting is so fierce that none of the combatants notice a strong nearby earthquake. After less than an hour of fighting, Hannibal's troops split apart the disorganized enemy column. From this point on, the battle becomes a slaughter. Numidians and Gauls overwhelm the Roman rear, forcing them all the way to the lake shore. Many try to swim in their heavy armor, desperate to get away. According to Polybius, many Romans drown in the lake, while others who manage to stay afloat beg for mercy, but are killed there and then. The Roman center fights a brave last stand, but after another two hours of fighting, most of Flaminius's men are cut down, while others drown in the lake as they try to swim away. According to legend, the Roman consul is recognized amidst the fighting, and the enraged Gauls fight to get to him. The consul's best troops rally to protect him. But one of the Gallic warriors fights his way through and thrusts his spear into the consul, killing him. Meanwhile, the Roman vanguard still stands firm. Once they realize that the battle is lost, they start fighting their way through Hannibal's heavy infantry, desperate to escape the field. But they too would be captured within a day or two after the battle. In less than three hours of fighting, a whole Roman army is virtually wiped out. It is said that Flaminius's body was torn to pieces by Gallic soldiers, so much so that Hannibal was not able to find any trace of the consul after the battle to give him a proper burial. Carthaginian losses, meanwhile, are minor. Large plunder is taken, especially military equipment. Hannibal re-equips his infantry. Each man is given Roman mail, a bronze helmet, and an oval scutum shield. Okay, so now think about the strategic balance of this conflict, right? The Romans are trying to threaten Carthage and New Carthage in, in Spain, in Iberia, um, away from Italy. But in Italy, Hannibal has the Gauls on his side. He has already wiped out a combined consular army and now an individual consular army with the only people, the only troops surviving the first one, being captured in the second one. So, um, this is not, not good for Rome. And in fact, I would argue that, that if Rome were not so uniquely situated in the ancient world to handle these types of losses and still maintain their society and, and revamp their military, that if they were like almost any other society at this time, they would have collapsed after this. Um, that it wouldn't have even taken the Battle of Cannae. Uh, however, once we get to the Battle of Cannae, that's we'll get into that in in more detail about Rome's ability to, you know, get you know get their arm chopped off, get their leg chopped off, and somehow just they just keep coming back. Within a few days, the Romans suffer another disastrous loss. As Servilius was on the move to join Flaminius, he hurriedly sent all of his 4,000 cavalry ahead of the army to help his co-consul. Hannibal learned of their movement even before Servilius knew about Flaminius's defeat. Mahabal, Hannibal's second in command, rode out to meet them, launching a surprise attack. Those who survived were captured. By eliminating Servilius's cavalry, Hannibal effectively neutralized his entire consular army. Few, if any, commanders have been able to match Hannibal's ambush at Lake Trasimene, where one entire army ambushed and effectively destroyed another entire army. 
the population of Rome fell into utter despair, as Lake Trasimene is not far, and it seems like there is nothing that can stop Hannibal from attacking the city, as Servilius had to withdraw back to Ariminium to counter the Gauls, who, encouraged by Hannibal's presence, aggressively began raiding Roman territory. In this time of crisis, the Senate appoints a dictator, a certain Fabius Maximus, to coordinate the defence against Hannibal. But more on that in the next episode. Okay, so yeah, we'll get into the Fab Fabian tactics in the next episode. That was the Battle of Lake Trasimene, uh, part six of the Hannibal series. Like, comment, subscribe. Keep helping me build the channel over here, and I will see you guys next time.